Hello and welcome to today's revision session on electrical fields. So in today's revision session what we're going to do is we're going to review the concepts of electrical fields. So let's look at an introduction to fields first. A field is an important concept to define in the universe. A field is a region in the universe where an object placed inside of it can experience a non-contact force due to its position in the field. The properties of the field are given by the virtual particles of the force interaction. So in gravitational fields we know that this particular example would be the property is mass but in electrical fields this property is charge now if an object has no charge it experiences no force inside of an electrical field now previously we've considered gravitational fields they act on objects with mass they extend to infinity they exert weak forces and are always attractive but as we move through this topic we can contrast electrical fields with gravitational fields because electrical fields act on objects with charge they extend to infinity they exert strong forces and can be attractive or repulsive now any field in physics can be described with four main properties and the definitions of these properties are consistent amongst all fields. So learning these definitions is integral to the understanding of the physics of any field. The first property is the, is the force law which details the force exerted between two objects inside the field and it's usually named after the famous scientist who worked in this particular part of physics. The second property is the field strength which details the force exerted on one object per unit property of the field due to the object being in that field, which is due to the field produced in the universe. So for example, the gravitational field strength is the force per unit mass experienced by an object inside a gravitational field. The potential details the energy stored in one object per unit property of the field due to the object being inside the field, which again is due to the field itself. So for example, the gravitational potential is the energy per unit mass experienced by an object inside a gravitational field. The fourth property is the work done. The potential difference sorry which details the work done moving an object per unit property of the field moving from one point in the field to another point in the field so the gravitational potential difference is the work done per unit mass experienced by an object moving from one point in the field to another point in the field now the absolute potential difference details the work done moving an object per unit property of the field from outside the field or infinity to into a point inside the field so the absolute gra gravitational potential difference is the work done per unit mass experienced by an object moving from outside the field to a point in the field. Now remembering these definitions is crucial to the understand the physics behind any field. So objects can either be contact forces, which are forces produced when objects are physically touching, or they can be non-contact forces, forces produced when objects can be physically separated. Now objects can exert non-contact forces by transmitting a field in space. A field is a region of space where a body can feel a force. So for example, the Earth's gravitational field is the region of space where you can experience the Earth's gravitational force and we represent these fields with field lines. Now the strength of a field is given by its field density. How many field lines are found in an area? Now this means that the closer you are to an object the denser the field lines the stronger the non-contact force. Now it's important to note that the, these field lines are drawn in straight lines from the object with arrows on them showing their direction. Now any charged object inside an electrical field of a particle will feel the electrical force. The objects do not have to be touching. So the electron is produced as a negative charge so will produce an electrical field. Now different electrically charged objects can have interacting field lines but they cannot overlap. Now it's important to note that field lines from charged objects can join up but they cannot cross. This is because the field lines show the movement movement of a unit positive charge in the field if it was placed at that point. So in this particular example, the positively charged particle will move towards the electron because the electric field lines always show a path a positive charge would, t would move if it was placed at that point. Electrical field notations always consider the impact of the positive charge. Now there's no fundamental principle behind this rule, a positive charge is just used to standardise all equations regardless of context. So for example, if we had a positive proton here, the field lines will point away from it because a positively charged particle would move away from a positively charged proton. So it's important to note this. Now how close the electrical field lines are together, the density of the field line shows the strength of the electrical force. So out further away from this electron, the field lines are more spread out, so the force is weaker, whilst the field lines are closer when you're very close to the electron, so it is a stronger force. Now we can use this in our ideas to look at Coulomb's law. Now Coulomb measured the electrostatic force between two electrical charges 
charges. I need to find opposite charges as having a attractive force and so give a negative value for the electrostatic force because a positive times a negative equals a negative. Now we measure R in this example as the separation of the charges from the center of mass of one particle to the center of mass of another particle. Now we also define that when objects have the same charges and therefore repulsive force to have a positive value because a positive times a positive is a positive and a negative times a negative is also a positive. Now Coulomb deduced the following that that the uh, magnitude of the force between charges Q1 and Q2 is proportional to the product of the charges and inversely proportional to the square of the distance between them which formed the basis of Coulomb's law. So we knew that F was directly proportional to 1 over R squared so when the separation is doubled the force exerted decreases by a factor of 4 2 squared and then you've got to use these relationships to then state the mathematical equation of Coulomb's law because Coulomb realized that F was directly proportional to Q1 Q2 over R squared and he then deduced the proportionality between these factors which was from F equals Q uh, sorry K times by Q1 Q2 over R squared where, where we can then use this idea to say that K is equal to 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0 where epsilon 0 is the permittivity of free space now at A level it's assumed that there is air or vacuum between the objects so if we look at Coulomb's equation, Coulomb's equation is F equals 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0 times by Q1 Q2 over R squared. So this allows us to calculate the electrostatic force between two objects due to their electrical fields, but both charged objects will experience this force, and so the force is the same force on each charge. However, this is very similar to the gravitational force equation, however charge is used instead of mass as it's charge that produces the electrical field, and there's a much larger constant used in the equation compared to the gravitational force because the electrical force is much larger than the gravitational force. So for Coulomb's law to be accurate, we assume three things. The objects are point charges, the charged objects are not touching, and the charged objects must be stationary. So this equation is very similar to Newton's law of gravitation, okay, very very similar indeed, except we're using charges and not masses and K instead of big G. Now the second prop thing to look at is field strength. Now the field strength can be shown on electrical field diagrams as the density of the field lines. So the electrical field strength is the force per unit charge experienced at a position in the field. So you've got radial fields where the electrical field strength changes at different places and uniform fields where the electrical field strength is the same everywhere. So we know that in a radial field the electrical field strength decreases with distance as the field density decreases but we know in uniform fields it stays the same because the density of the field line stays the same. Now electrical field strength is a vector quantity so it points in the direction of positive charge with moves because we define all electrical field quantities in terms of positive charges. Again there's no fundamental reason for this. Now it's important to note that our definition definition of electrical field strength is therefore the force per unit positive charge experienced at a position in the field. Now we give this units of newtons per coulomb or nc minus 1. So our general equation for any electrical field is equal to electrical field strength is force over charge. Now we can also have an equation for just uniform fields which are electrical field strength is potential difference between two plates divided by the distance. So this gives us units of volts per meter. Now newtons per coulomb and volts per meter are equivalent however volts per meter is only used in the context of uniform fields. Now we can also derive an equation for radial fields, so consider two particles each producing a radial field and we know the force between them is F equals Q1 Q2 over 4 pi epsilon 0 R squared, so we know also that E equals F over Q1, so that we can sub that into our equation as shown here, therefore we can then cancel through uh, one of the object's charges and therefore this gives us our equation for radial field strength, okay, with the equation E equals Q over 4 pi epsilon 0 R squared. Now, this allows us to work out our electrical field strength for a radial field. So if we consider a radial electrical field of an object, we realize that the electrical field strength decreases with separation from a charge, so E is directly proportional to 1 over R squared. It's an inverse square law. Now, this works out because the electrical field line density is decreasing as you move away from the particle. The field line density is decreasing. However, if the charged object is not a point charge, then the electrical field strength is not 
not E is directly proportional to 1 over R squared at all points in the field. It's only true from the surface of the charged objects. So there are three equations to work out the electrical field strength. One is the general equation for all electrical fields. One is the equation for uniform fields only. And one is the equation for radial fields only. Now remember when using the radial field equation, you must square the distance between from the charge. It's a common mistake people make. Now the next topic to look at is the motion of charged particles. So from the concepts covered in previous lessons, it's understood that a charged particle will interact with an electrical field when it's placed in a region. So consider a uniform field produced between two parallel plates with a potential difference between them. We know this is a uniform field because the field line density is the same throughout and the point in the direction a positive charge would move at that point in the field. So the field lines point towards the one negative of the two plates. So our potential difference here is 800 volts. Now if we place a charged particle in the field, it will experience a force due to being in the field and charged. It's the definition of an electrical field. Now the magnitude of the force can be calculated by using our electrical field strength equations and this will cause the particle to accelerate in a particular direction, which is the mechanism behind how all particle accelerators work. So we can work it out by saying A is equal to F over M. So the acceleration experienced by a particle is directly, it's dependent on uh, the charge as F equals EQ. So therefore acceleration and charge are directly proportional to each other and acceleration and mass are inversely proportional to each other and acceleration and the charge to mass ratio of the particle are directly proportional to each other. So if we consider a particle already moving in the electrical field, the particle wishes to continue in its motion. It has inertia. However, if the electrical field is acting parallel to the charged particle's motion, a resultant force will act in the same direction as the motion on the object, so it will cause the object to accelerate by changing speed. Now again, it's important to know that the field lines of the direction a positive charge would, would take place in, would move in. If a negative charge, if a positive charge is moving on the field line, parallel to the field line, it will speed up in the direction of the field line. But if a negative charge is moving along a field line, parallel to the field line, it will speed up in the, di in the opposite direction to the field line. Now, if we consider it going a perpendicular to do this and have a perpendicular motion to the field lines, the particle will wish to continue in its motion. It has inertia. However, if if the electrical field is acting perpendicular to the charged particle's motion, a resultant force will act on the object 90 degrees to its motion. So it will cause acceleration by changing direction. So it causes acceleration by deflection. So this is an important idea to note. So it will act like a centripetal force. Now remember the field lines are the direction a positive charge would take. So if a positive charge is moving perpendicular to the field lines, it will deflect in the direction of the field lines. If it's a negative charge moving perpendicular to the field lines, it will deflect in the opposite direction to the field line. Now remember in all cases the charged particle will not change speed, it will only change direction as the force is acting perpendicular to motion. So it's important to note that if we place a charged particle in a field it will experience a force due to being in the field and this force is a resultant force on the object. The positively charged particles will accelerate in the same direction and the negatively charged particles will accelerate in the opposite direction and no charge will have no acceleration as experiences no resultant force. So it's important to note that the charged object will plot out a parabolic path in a uniform field if they are moving perpendic if the electrical field is perpendicular to the motion because it has inertia in its horizontal path and a resultant force in its vertical path so therefore the two effects combine to form a parabolic path now this means that the parabolic path will only occur as there's inertia in one direction and a resultant force in the other direction so again note that if it's a negative charge will have a parabolic path but in the opposite direction now this means means that if the particle will continue the same speed in the plane in 90 degrees to the field. Now if the motion of the charged particle is perpendicular to the electrical field, the electrical force accelerates the particle deflect by deflection, so this causes an already moving charged particle to move in a parabolic path, but if the motion of the charged particle is parallel to the electrical field, the electrical field accelerates the particle by changing speed. So this will cause the particle to maintain the same direction of motion but to change speed. So in this example, the charged particle has a parabolic path because it's accelerating the vertical plane but maintains a constant speed in the horizontal plane. Now, if the particle was not moving when it entered the field, it would not carry out a parabolic path, rather it would accelerate up or down dependent on the charge. Inertia in one plane causes a parabolic path to be taken by the particle. But in A-level physics, we only consider moving particles in an electrical field. Now we can work out the size of the deflection in the path by comparing the charge to mass ratios of the different charged particles entering the electrical field. The higher the charge to mass 
charge ratio of the particle, the greater the deflection of the charged particle in the electrical field. So let's now consider electrical potential. If we consider an electrical field produced by a positive charge, because we use positive charges in our definitions, okay, any other charge object placed in the electrical field will become a store of electrical potential energy. The electrical potential energy stores produced as a result of the resulting electrostatic force act on the object due to being in the field. So this gives us the concept of absolute electrical potential. It's the electrical potential energy stored per unit positive charge due to being placed at a point in the electrical field, which we give the symbol V. Now we can set the absolute electrical potential to be zero at any place. But we set this to be outside the field, which we call infinity, which we define as any place outside of our electrical field. Now we do this because the particle, if it was outside the field, would no longer feel a force from the field and would no longer be an electrical potential energy store. So we can calculate electrical potential with our equation of electrical potential energy divided by charge. So again, this equation comes from our definition and it gives us units of joules per coulomb, which is the same as the volt, which links into our work we've done in the electricity module earlier in the course. So if an object starts off close to a charge, making the, uh, making the field and moves away, its potential tends to zero as the charge object moves to infinity if the charge in the field is positive and the electrical potential is positive. However, if the charge in the field is negative, the charge starts off far away from the charge uh, making the field that moves closer, so it means its potential tends to infinity as the charge object tends to zero, which leads to our following graphs. So these graphs show the electrical potential of an object changes with the distance from the charge object producing the electrical field. So this can be considered when the object in the field experiencing a repulsive force, and this is when experiencing an attractive force, which we can see with what's going on in these particular labels as shown here. Now we can calculate the absolute electrical potential for a radial field with the following equation. V equals Q over 4 pi epsilon zero R. Now this equation is only applicable to radial fields but electrical potential and the um and the energy are related with the term 1 over R. So it's important to note that when work done per charge equals force per charge times by distance, this indicates that multiplying the electrical field strength by the distance gives the electrical potential, as we can see here, as we can work it through like so. So this means that basically field strength and force are related by the term 1 over R squared, so it's an inverse square relationship, whilst energy and potential are related by the term 1 over R, so it's an inversely proportional relationship, which is is a very important idea to note. So we can use these equations for either radial fields or any electrical field dependent on the context. Now we can interchange these equations if the field is radial and therefore these we can interchange these equations if these fields are produced by a charge which can be useful in deriving values in the question. But please be aware electrical potential is a vector whilst electrical potential energy is a scalar because electrical potential is defined as a positive when shown repulsion and a negative when shown attraction which comes from our electrical potential potential from the charge aspect of the electrical potential equation. But electrical potential energy is a scalar term as it's stored in the object. There's no direction to the energy stored in an object. Now any charged object inside an electrical field will have an absolute electrical potential. The electrical potential energy stored in the object per positive charge due to being located at that point in the field. Because any charged object in an electrical field becomes a store of electrical potential energy. So this is considered scalar again as we mentioned before and it's considered an absolute quantity as it's not dependent on any other factor except the electrical field. But then we can use this to define electrical potential because electrical potential is the work done per unit positive charge to move a charged object from infinity to the point in the electrical field. Now at infinity we've defined the electrical potential to be zero because the object is not in the electrical field. Inside the electrical field the electrical potential is non-zero as it's become an electrical potential energy store due to being in the field. Now this value is either positive or negative depending on whether it's attraction or so absolute electrical potential is the energy stored per unit positive charge due to the charge object being placed in the field, whilst electrical potential Okay, as we notice here, is the work done per unit charge in moving a charged object into the electrical field from infinity. So this means that electrical potential and absolute electrical potential are the same magnitude, however the directions might alter as the electrical potential considers attraction and repulsion. Now this leads to a fundamental concept in physics. Moving an object into different areas of potential needs work to be carried out. So if a charged object moves between areas of different potential, work must be done into or out of the object. So if a 
charged object moves between areas of different potential, the direction of work is given by either the attractive or repulsive nature of the force. So if we consider the following diagram. Now dashed lines in the electrical field line diagrams represent the different potentials found in the electrical field. So charged objects can move between different areas of electrical potential, but it requires work to be done. So we say the charged object is moved due to potential difference. And this is the process behind how all electrical circuits work. A potential difference causes a current, a flow of charged particles. So in this particular example, our potential difference is 120 volts. So a charged object in an area of potential difference will accelerate, which we've covered previously before. Because the electrical potential, now this allows us to work out the work done per unit charge needed to move a charged object, because the electrical potential is the energy at each level per unit charge, which is the definition for potential difference you've encountered earlier in physics. So we know that potential difference is the work done over charge, so therefore the work done is the charge times by the potential difference, telling you that the work done needed to move a charge object between two points of potential difference in an electrical field. Now Q in this equation refers to the charge of the object moving, not the charge the object produced in the field. So this occurs as the charge is the object itself moving, so therefore is the work that needs to be done. Now from the previous equations, electrical field strength and potential, okay, what happens is you can work out the properties of the field itself from that, so that that's the charge of the object produced in the field. But this equation tells you the work done needs to move a charged object, and it's directly proportional to the potential difference if the charge remains the same. So it's important to note that idea, that work done is directly proportional to the charge if the PD is constant. Now in this diagram, the dashed line shows the plane in the field where the electrical potential is the same. Now we call these lines lines of equipotential. Now, work is needed to be done to move a charged object between planes of different potential. However, there's no, if there's no change in potential along a line of equipotential, there is no work being done. So no work is done when a charged object travels along a equipotential line or an equipotential surface. Now, lines of equipotential are always represented by dashed lines, and no work is done when they travel along an equipotential plane. So, lines of equipotential are found at 90 degrees or perpendicular to the field lines of the electrical field, and you'd be expected to do Reduce lines of electrical potential, sorry, equipotential from electrical field line diagrams, whether they be either uniform fields or radial fields. Now, the last topic we're going to look at are potential gradients. So, in the previous concepts, we've looked at planes of equipotential. We can also consider pl the planes of equipotential to be like blocks. So, we can visualize it like this. So, it's a representation of how the electrical potential varies in an electrical field. It's a representation of how the energy stored per coulomb varies in an electrical field. So, this produces a potential gradient in the electrical field as shown here. Now the electric, the potential gradient can be thought of as the change in electrical potential with respect to distance. So the potential gradient is the change in electrical potential in the electrical field per distance. So the closer the planes of equipotential in the field, the greater the potential gradient in the electrical field. So work has to be done for objects to travel down the potential gradient. Okay, so here the electrical field is doing the work moving the, the charge, so the work done is negative. So when there is an attraction between the charges, the work done will be negative. Now, if the electrical, if the charge moves along an area of no potential gradient, then no work has to be done. That's a line or surface of equipotential. Now, going down a potential gradient means work is done out of the system, but going up a potential gradient means work is done into the system, which gives us a positive value for work done. So when there's repulsion between the charges, the work done is positive. Now, a steep gradient means a lot of work must be put into the system to move the charge object up the gradient and the steep gradient means a lot of work will be released from the system to move a charge object down the gradient. Now we can also graph this concept here. So the gradient of this graph is the potential difference. It's the electrical potential on the y-axis and the distance on the uh, on the x-axis. So this means the graph to graph this will be e potential against the distance from the charge object produced in the field. So again the steeper the line the greater the potential gradient the more work that has to be done into or out of the system. So we know that that gradient is equal to the change in potential over the distance r here. So we can place this equation into the equation for potential, so you can work it through as such like that. We collate the terms together, so it means the potential gradient is the same quantity as the electrical field strength of our field. So the gradient of a graph of V against R is the potential gradient, because it's the electrical field strength. So here the equipotentials are equally spaced out, giving a straight line graph. 
so the gradient will not change. And remember, our electrical field strength is equal to the potential gradient. Now, it's important to note that in a uniform field, electrical field strength is constant, so the potential gradient is constant. You get a nice straight line graph. But here, in a radial field, the, e the electrical field strength does change, so the gradient will change and the potential gradient will change. So you've got your radial field and you've got your uniform field, which is the gradient is given by E is equal to Q over 4 pi epsilon 0 R squared, whilst the gradient for a uniform field is constant because the electrical field strength does not change. Now, from our previous idea of potential gradient, we can derive another key idea because the gradient of the tangent to the graph will give the gradient of the electrical uh, will give the gradient of the potential gradient or the electrical field strength of the field. So here, V is changing with R for a positive charge. So V is initially positive and tends to zero as R moves to infinity, whilst here, a V is initially negative and tends to zero as R moves to infinity. So if we consider our graph here, the gradient of our graph is the electrical field strength. So we know that gradient is equal to V over R and we know V over R is equal to E. So therefore we can rearrange this equation and make E the subject. So E is equal, so delta V, sorry, is equal to E times by R, which indicates to us that the area under the line of an E against R graph, where E is the electrical field strength and R is the distance from the charge produced in the field, that will give you okay, our idea of potential difference because area is equal to y axis times by x axis so if you're asked to estimate potential difference from an e against r graph you'll have to work out the area under the graph by counting the number of squares or by splitting the areas up into trapeziums so you can see it via this particular idea so it's important to note that in electrical potential distance graphs the gradient is the potential gradient or the electrical field strength and for an electrical field strength distance graph the area under the line is going to be your potential difference so to summarize what we've learned so far we should be able to understand what our Coulomb's law equation is and treated that there's a vacuum between the two charged objects and a comparison in the magnitude of gravitational and the electrostatic force between subatomic particles. We can represent electrical fields with electrical field lines. We understand electrical field strength and the equations we use to give them. We can understand the trajectory of moving charged particles entering a uniform electrical field at right angles. We understand the definition of absolute electrical potential, including zero value and infinity and of electrical potential difference. The work done in moving a charge Q by delta, delta W is equal to Q delta V. We understand equipotential surfaces and that no work can be done moving a charge along an equipotential surface. And we know the graphical representations of E and V with R, where V is related to E by E is the gradient of that particular graph. And you can work out your potential difference from an area under the graph of E against R. So I hope you've enjoyed today's revision session on electrical fields. Thank you very much for listening and have a lovely day.